Our first session today is a keynote titled By Any Means Necessary, When Black Abstraction Becomes Black Representation by Margot Crawford. The Edmund J. and Louis W. Kahn, Professor for Faculty Excellence, University of Pennsylvania. After Margot's keynote, there will be a brief audience Q&A. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Welcome everyone, and I want to begin by thanking Hor and Salah, and I'm truly honored to be here today. When people throughout the diaspora gave themselves the name black, they gave themselves a strategic abstraction, not what we have assumed to be strategic essentialism. Consider how the 1960s US mobilizations of the word black greatly inspired a similar healing process in the South African black diasporic movement. During the 1975-1976 trial, Steve Beekle, the founder of the black consciousness movement in South Africa, is asked to explain why black South Africans refer to themselves as black, as opposed to brown. As the trial puts blackness itself on trial, Beekle and Judge Boshoff have the following exchange. Judge Boshoff, but now why do you refer to you people as blacks? Why not brown people? I mean, you people are more brown than black. Biko, in the same way as I think white people are more pink and yellow and pale than white. Judge Boshoff, quite, but now why do you not use the word brown then? Biko, no, I think really historically we have been defined as black people and when we reject the term non-white and take upon ourselves the right to call ourselves what we think we are, we have got available in front of us a whole number of alternatives. Steve Beagle claims the power of the word black when it is reclaimed as a strategic abstraction as quote, a whole number of alternatives. As opposed to strategic essentialism, 1960s and 1970s global black consciousness movements may have been more tied to strategic abstraction. Abstraction, not essentialism, may be the starting point of the most radical identity politics movements. As people begin to break bread together, they start with the dough. The transformation of the dough into the mimetic forms is never total. I want to begin by thinking about the strategic abstraction of Barbara Chase Rabu. Barbara Chase Rabu leans into the politics of black abstraction as she returns to the black power movement in her 21st century art. In 2003, she returns to her Malcolm X series, begun in 1969. This abstract sculpture, the Malcolm X series, created between 1969 and 2017, is a stunning play with softness and hardness. Each sculpture in the series combines cast bronze and silk fibers. In a 2014 interview, Chase Rabu explains that when she made these Malcolm X sculptures, she was thinking about the fact that public monuments memorializing heroic historical figures are somehow not supposed to be abstract. Public monuments are supposed to embody the urgency of representation and the need to remember. But Chase Rabu uses the concrete texture of the cast bronze abstractions to express the concrete work of the visionary Malcolm X. Her explanation in the Malcolm Stells and the silenced X of the quote, third materiality that quote, took abstraction in a new and entirely original direction offers a lucid theory of the destruction of binaries that can be achieved through black abstraction. In the forward of the 2000 edition of Black Fire, Amiri Baraka develops a similar theory of black abstraction as the overcoming of binaries. He writes, quote, in that emotional spontaneity, there was not an advanced enough unity to maintain the eclectic entity that black had brought together. As Chase Rabu explains her process of creating the Malcolm Stells, it is clear that X became that which Amiri Baraka refers to as, quote, that eclectic entity that black had brought together. On the meta level, Chase Rabu's full description 
of her process of making the stels is an explanation of the theory and practice of black abstraction. In this same essay, the Malcolm Stells, same interview, the Malcolm Stells and the Silence X, she writes, a word about the metamorphosis of the soft silk into solidity and the hard bronze into fluidity. In the collage of these materials, there occurs the alchemy of metamorphosis, as the British painter Frank Bowling would put it, a celebration of the impure coalescence or collision of materials that can both signify and undermine time-honored ideas about abstraction. The first time it happened, I was astounded. Then I realized it would happen, then I realized it would happen every time if I was careful, and that this phenomenon had relevatory importance to the sculpture and what I was trying to do. The combination of these elements took abstraction in a new and entirely original direction. The transformation of the materiality of the two opposing elements had produced a third materiality, neither hard nor soft, black nor white, male nor female, totally visual nor totally literary. Why does she name this abstract third materiality Malcolm X and granted all the blackness that this leader of the black power movement held and inspired? When she first names this work in 1969, she seems to anticipate the spirit of what I have called black post-blackness, the need to almost make blackness itself the soft silk that needs solidity and the hard bronze that needs more fluidity. This sculpture literally bridges the gap between the 1960s and the 21st century. Malcolm X, the constant muse of so many black arts movement artists, emerges in this sculpture as an abstraction with a political message that can only be known if we enter into Chase Raboo's entanglement of the hard and the soft, what blackness was and what blackness will be. Will be. A.B. Spellman in Big Bushy Afros, his 1998 retrospective manifesto on the black arts movement writes, abstraction did not cost consciousness as he remembers the refusal to let go of the political and the more abstract art produced during the movement. When Barbara Chase Rabu was first working on the Malcolm X sculpture, she thought this art was, quote, a non-political experiment. In a letter written three days after traveling to Algiers, Algiers for the first Pan-African Cultural Festival in 1969, Chase Rabu wrote, quote, I have found an underlining theme for the new series of sculptures, which is quite tremendous, and is going to make, I think, a lot of controversy combining what I know of architecture with what I know of design with what I know about North Africa and Africa itself. I suppose the revolutionaries have gotten to me, but this is truly, quote, a non-political experiment. More later, when I've figured out a few more things. When she returned to this Malcolm X sculpture three decades after the 1960s, she, quote, did figure out a few things. She figured out how to finish this abstract art. It seems that the only way to complete the sculpture series was by continuing the flow between the polished bronze sculpture and the black bronze sculpture. The tension in this sculpture series is between polished, quote, total abstraction and the limits of that impulse to think that any sculpture with what she describes as a Malcolm X, quote, underlining theme, could be, quote, truly a non-political experiment. Malcolm X's own language offers a way of understanding her shifts back and forth between the polished bronze and the black bronze. When Malcolm X referred to realism in the 1960s, he made nonviolent resistance to global white supremacy sound like an abstract vision. In a 1965 speech, Malcolm X explains, I don't favor violence. If we could bring about recognition and respect of our people by peaceful means, well and good. Everybody would like to reach his objectives peacefully. But I'm also a realist. The only people in this country who are asked to be nonviolent are black people. Chase Raboo's Malcolm X sculpture allows us to rehear Malcolm X's admission, quote, I'm also a realist, and also remember Malcolm X's suggestion that his revolutionary visions complicated realism. He wasn't always a realist. Sometimes Malcolm X needed the abstraction that we hear in his speeches 
when he made the words by any means necessary sound like a call to act and a call to dream. A 1974 editorial cartoon in Black World, the journal Black World, one of the most central journals during the global black arts movement, is prime evidence of the complex questions about the representation and abstraction tension during this 1960s and early 1970s black arts movement. The focus on the all black canvas in this cartoon is one in one of the most central black arts movement journals, dramatizes the tension between black abstraction and black representation. This 1974 cartoon created by Walt Carr includes a black man looking through a stack of all black canvases and asking the black artist who is in the process of creating yet another all black painting. Hey man, I agree that black is beautiful, but wow, isn't this going a bit far? The wit in this cartoon works on multiple levels. The gesture to black is beautiful being a huge abstraction, a move to the serial production of nothingness is as much a part of the wit as the more subtle gesture to the idea that the black arts movement's full embrace of an unapologetically black aesthetic was truly radical, quote, going a bit far. The cartoon stages black aesthetic radicalness as the move to black abstraction. These black arts movement canvases are black representational space, but this editorial cartoon stages the inseparability of black representational space and black abstraction. When A.B. Spellman writes, quote, some called it my medic, but I thought it was surreal, a surreal negritudinous dream. He is recognizing that the black representational space of the, of the black arts movement was often the space of the surreal and the abstract. The visual arts collective with the name African Commune of Bad Relevant Artists, Afrocobra, began during this black arts movement and produced some of the movement's most vivid images of the tension between the representational and the abstract. In Perspectives, Commentaries on Afro-Cobra, Larry Neal described Afro-Cobra's visual narrative of a nation, quote, visual narrative of a nation asserting its artistic consciousness. In the essay, 10 in search of a nation, in search of a nation, published in 1969, Jeff Donaldson proclaims, check out the image. The words are an attempt to posit where we are coming from and to introduce how we are going, where we are going. Check out the image. Words do not define, describe relevant images. Relevant images define, describe themselves. Dig on the image. This insistence on the visual relevance that does not need a verbal explanation connects more than we may initially realize with Afrocobra's interest in both abstract, abstract and representational art. The repetition of the words, check out the image, even as the power of the words is also emphasized, suggests an interest in words' ability to name and clarify visual images, as well as a worry about the need to explain images. Afrocobra's assertion of visual power, check out the image, sounds so simple in comparison to the collective's descriptions of, quote, mimesis at midpoint. They describe mimesis at midpoint in the following manner in many of the Afrocobra brochures. Mimesis and midpoint design that marks the spot where the real and the unreal, the objective and the non-objective, the plus and the minus meet, a point exactly between absolute abstractions and absolute naturalism. Images that mark the spot where the real and the overreal, the plus and the minus, the abstract and the concrete meet. In order to fully, quote, check out the images of Afrocobra, the lushness of their aesthetic tenets, such as shine, expressive awesomeness, and mimesis at midpoint must also be checked out. In addition to deserving an award for the most evocative self-naming, African commune of bad relevant artists, the collective created lush manifestos in which they explored the principles that defined their aesthetic vision. Afrocobra continues to thrive as one of the most dynamic visual art collectives tied to African diasporic aesthetics. The Black Arts Movement was the launching pad for this collective's ongoing aesthetic movement. Thinking about the very name of the collective, we wonder how did abstraction remain bad and relevant? When Afrocobra committed themselves to depictions of the real 
They were not understanding the real as a stable, fixed form. The collective's enactment of realness is similar to the alternative reality so lucidly articulated by the black arts movement playwright Ed Bullins. Ed Bullins writes, each individual and the crowd should have his sense of reality confronted, his consciousness assaulted. When representational art takes the form of assaulting people's sense of reality, we see that the boundary between representational art and abstraction dissolves. Abstraction for abstraction's sake really may be too easy when people are seeking liberation from an aesthetic system of power that is profoundly anti-black. In a 2012 interview, Nelson Stevens explained that as, as he produced the centennial vision mural, he was thinking about mimesis at midpoint and fully aware that, quote, there was always the risk that you could go too far into total abstraction. The productive tension between the practice of representation and the practice of abstraction is embedded in the tradition of radical black feminism. In the early 1970s, when black women artists formed the Where We At Collective, they highlighted the tension between frames and excess. This resonant name of the collective, Where We At, is more than a name. It is also a way of understanding the artistic practice of radical black feminist artists. The shaping of art around this question, Where We At, is art that does not locate the work of representation. As Dinga McCannon, an artist, one of the artists in the Where We At Collective, describes her artistic process, she makes Where We At sound like what if. Dinga McCannon writes, I work intuitively. Each work is made using multi-layered processes, exploring what if and experimenting with what might, what might happen if I mix and match whatever medium I'm utilizing at the moment. McCannon's art creates a positionality of what if. And in Tazaki Shonge's For Color Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough, there is a litany of statements announcing black women's position outside particular locations, outside particular cities. Shonge writes, I'm outside Chicago, I'm outside Detroit, I'm outside Houston, I'm outside San Francisco, I'm outside Manhattan, I'm outside St. Louis. In Shonge's, in Tazaki Shonge's 1976 introduction to For Color Girls, she uses the abstract image of an arched, of a quote, arched back over a yawn as a way of explaining the play's investment and the sensuality of a black feminist collective consciousness that is set in motion by being exhausted and bored by the dominant ways of talking about being black and a woman. One of the most cited lines in For Color Girls is surely, quote, but being alive and being a woman and being colored is a metaphysical dilemma I haven't conquered yet. Shonge finds a new grammar through dance and word that lets us feel black feminism in motion. Shonge's abstract image, this arched back over a yawn, is the practice of abstraction that makes the impulse to represent emerge as a surprise dance move, as an unexpected feeling that lingers even in a dominant choreography of representation. Glenn Ligon's word paintings show how representation is often a gesture, not a destination. The gestures of representation have been misread as the marks of representation. The desire to see marked blackness obscures art that is gesturing to unmarked blackness. In his word paintings, Ligon shapes this tension between marked blackness and the gestures to unmarked blackness into a practice of black abstraction. Ligon's smudged words do not smudge representational space, the smudging gestures to another layer, a new form of representational space that is not yet here, like Fred Moden's theory of blur as a way of seeing. Ligon's smudging reframes the discourse of representation so that it does not pivot on any impulse toward transparency or knowability. Smudging blackness is not an erasure of blackness. Ligon's smudging shows the excess in color and texture that is, created, that is created through the mix of coal dust, printing ink, glue, gesso, and graphite on canvas. Barbara Joan Hogel's printmaking during the Black Arts Movement anticipates Ligon's work with coal dust. In the screen print Untitled, created in 1969, Jones Hogel makes the words a time to unite and black people together look like a foreground that emerges out of a smudged background. As the words rise like an arc on both sides of a profile of a face, 
The hair and the facial profile merges with the smudged background. The texture of the hair and the texture of the smudged background look like the conditions that allow the words to emerge. The foreground does not have the texture of the backgrounds. The words do not look like they can be touched in the manner that the hair and the black layers underneath the tan words look like they could be stroked and known through touch. Jones Hogel makes the words, the foreground, seem to be the visual clarity, the strategic abstraction that emerges out of the blur that remains too abstract to invite any form of reading. Ligon explains his text paintings in the following manner. Quote, the movement of language towards abstraction is a consistent theme in my work. I'm interested in what happens when a text is difficult to read or frustrates legibility. What that says about our ability to think about each other, know each other, process each other. The words, quote, the movement of language towards abstraction capture the role that language and other forms of representation play in the practice of black abstraction. Afro Kober's principle of lettering was not only the collective's desire to make sure that the art would be message oriented and experienced as a part of a collective black arts movement mission. The lettering was also a desire to make the painting of words matter, to make the painting of words a viable artistic technique. Afro Kober paintings of colorful letters and words often stage the tension between the abstract nature of color and the representational system <coughs> that makes letters and words become signs that can no longer be viewed as random marks and brush strokes. The use of the word lettering in the Afrocobra manifestos, as opposed to simply stating in their manifestos their commitment to adding words to, to paintings, shows the collective's interest in painting parts of words and showing how words are formed through a process of following the lines and curves of an established sign system. Afrocobra's lettering is not entirely different from Ligon's smudging. Many Afrocober paintings make the painting of letters become the discovery of the unexpected curves and shapes that can be formed, even as one follows the sign-making rules of recognizable language. Many of Ligon's text paintings begin with legible words and progress as the eyes move from the top to the bottom of the canvas. To the smudged illegible words, the steadily progressing smudging dramatizes the final arrival at the opaque. The normative space between words and letters disappears. We stop trying to read what seems so illegible. We might wish we could simply touch the braille-like texture created with the coal dust, glue, printing ink, gesso, and graphite. Or we might experience the wonder of the text paintings as the feeling that we are touching the words as they fade away. Through a haptic type of sight, we feel the art of evanescence conveyed by the smudging and compression of letters and words. The lettering in Barbara Jones Hogan's Unite begs to be compared to the movement of language towards abstraction in Ligon's text paintings. This screen print has an abstract background with colorful triangular shapes that contain the word Unite. In the lower part of the poster, there's a gathering of people wearing all black with arms raised high with tightly clenched, determined black power fists. The figures with the black power fists are in the foreground, and the kaleidoscopic imaging of Unite in the background is the background that has the sharp verticalness of a wall. In this screen print, Jones Hogel fully anticipates Ligon's movement of language towards abstraction. The intersecting, overlapping prisms with the word Unite epitomize the practice of black abstraction. Jones Hogel uses the abstraction of the word Unite to intensify the call to Unite. The abstraction of the word enlarges the vision of the black power fist. The background wall of abstraction is the horizon to which the black power fist and the raised arms seem to aspire. Seeing the background in Jones Hogel's Unite as a wall of abstraction is an important step toward understanding the concrete work that the black arts movement wanted black abstraction to accomplish. Carrie James Marshall's Kerry James Marshall builds on the black arts movement legacy in his 2012 exhibit, Who's Afraid of Red, Black, and Green? The paintings in this exhibit test the capacity of abstraction and representation to be each other's conditions of possibility. Marshall's most acclaimed art is highly figurative, but his abstract paintings are as innovative. Red, if they come in the morning, one of the paintings in Who's Afraid of Red, Black, and Green exhibit, makes the difference between the practice of abstraction and the practice of representation become the difference between choosing to look at color 
without letting language overdetermine it and shape it into representational space, and choosing to read the barely visible words that refuse to allow the color to remain abstract. Marshall wants us to remain in the liminal state where we cannot decide to look or read. He wants us to be immersed in the powerfully abstract redness and still be able to read the urgent words if they come in the morning, words of solidarity echoing the words in James Baldwin's 1970 letter to Angela Davis. For if they take you in the morning, they will be coming for us that night. Marshall wonders in this painting if the ability to feel the red creates the ability to read the almost hidden words, and if the ability to read the almost hidden words creates the ability to feel the depth of the color. The close reading is the condition of possibility for feeling the color. Feeling the color is the condition of possibility for close reading. Marshall makes the representational space tied to reading depend on the abstraction tied to seeing and feeling. Let me end with the performance, a performance of strategic abstraction in Haki Matabuti's poem, Gwendolyn Brooks. Matabuti writes, into the 60s, a word was born, black. And with black came poets, and from the poets, ball points came black, double black, purple black, blue black, been black, was black, day before yesterday, blacker than, ultra black, super black, black black, yellow black, nigger black, black white man, blacker than you ever be, one fourth black, unblack, cold black, clear black, my mama's blacker than your mama, pimple black, fall black, soul black, we can't even see you, black on black and black by black, technically black, man tan black, winter black, cool black, 360 degrees black, cold black, midnight black, black when it's convenient, rusty black, moon black, black star black, summer black, Electron black, spaceman black, shoe shine black, gym shoe black, underwear black, ugly black, Aunt Jemima black, Uncle Ben Rice black, Willie Best black, black is beautiful, black I just discovered black, Negro black, unsubstance black. Thank you. So I've been told there's time for questions. I believe is this the, the remaining time is only we have very few uh, minutes, uh, about four minutes or less. Oh, but, oh, pardon me. Okay, we do have more. Okay, thank you. I couldn't. I didn't know what. Okay, thank you. We have more time. <laughs> I'm uh, James Meyer, National Gallery of the United States. It was a lovely talk, and uh, I so appreciated your reading of the Barbara Chase Raboud, the way she combines um, hardness and softness and sort of a structure of neither norness that you described. But the series is called Malcolm X, and I'm wondering if you could, who I associate not with neither norness, but with a very, um, well, the ultimate militant black nationalist position by the late 60s. So I'm wondering, what's the relationship for you between the title and the neither nor structure or formal structure of those works? I appreciate that question, I really do. I think that Barbara Chase Rabu in this sculpture might actually be resisting, you know, that very impulse, at least, you know, in the quick question, I'm sure if you had more time, maybe you would also say more about this, but at least how you framed it quickly, right, necessarily quickly due to our limited time, um, you know, that impulse to then move Malcolm X outside, right, of uh, the complexity, the nuances, right, if we go back to everything that is on her mind, even when she describes the stells, right, you know, that interplay between the soft and the hardness, as you're underscoring. I think that she, the sculptor, and perhaps us also as viewers of this art, 
should, you know, are, are led to resist uh, that very need to pin Malcolm X down. I think that uh, to fully allow Malcolm X, if we play even with these ideas of softness and hardness, to then appreciate the fluidity that he embodied to, you know, if we had more time, clearly there's so much we could say, we're just going to think about the full life and the work, the cultural work that Malcolm X uh, did. But it's hard for me to not, I think for many of us, right, to not appreciate uh, the fluidity of that work, to know that there is nothing uh, about his full journey and that type of self-criticism and constant evolution and rethinking uh, so much of the complexity of black nationalism and thinking about how that opens up to what uh, people like Mary Brock and others then even in their own path, not toward a repudiation of earlier forms of black nationalism, but what they posited as then the third world Marxism and thinking about that as something that uh, continues to be entangled with the black nationalism, I think that's very fluid. I think that um, Barbara Chase Rabu, even she, she herself, when we think about this fluidity and her interest in returning to the Malcolm X Stells, right, in the 21st century, and then when she thinks she's done, so she, 2008, she thinks she's done, and then she makes more, so it's a total of 20. She can't stop. She herself is also trying to figure out something about Malcolm X, something about uh, her own impulse to think, and that's why I wanted to share some of that language where she's initially thinking, oh no, early on I knew, or I thought this was non-political art, and then the way that she's actually complicating her own terms. Thank you so much, Margo. This is Naminata from the Africa Institute. Girl, you can <laughs> rap. <laughs> yes, I just have this quick question about black abstraction. And you were sometimes talking about absolute abstraction, total abstraction in abstraction. Does that mean that there are multiple shades or grades of abstraction? Are there degrees or kinds? And then what, as a quick question also, what about black in abstraction, black as abstraction, as opposed to black? So can you say more about what do those questions evoke for you? Thank, Thank you. you so much, Naminat. I appreciate, I surely appreciate that question, absolutely. Um, the collective Afro-Cobra, when they then coined this phrase, my Mises at midpoint, and in some of the interviews that I did um, when I was completing um, Black Pulse Blackness, I was struck by the way that they were emphasizing you know, that my Mises at midpoint in so many ways was a phrase that allowed them to think about what was at stake, you know, in terms of their sense that this movement, this political movement, this grounded movement, that it needed abstraction, that there was a role for abstraction in this movement, and then also this sense, and you've heard some of this language throughout the talk, right, this sense that you quote, you know, when Nelson Stevens says you don't want to go too far, right, you know, this sense that it perhaps, and I pause a bit because they say different things in different interviews and even different ways that even in some of those catalog copies, right, the way they're using my Mises at midpoint, but absolutely in terms of the prime question you're asking, you know, what, what, how did they understand total abstraction and how it might we even um, in a larger sense understand total abstraction in relation to something like black abstraction. I think that, um, they, in some cases with mimesis at midpoint, were thinking, obviously, you know, that emphasis on midpoint, this sense that uh, what I'm calling strategic abstraction, right? You know, this sense that it can't be abstraction for abstraction's sake, right? That then total abstraction 
might be uh, that sense that if abstraction is going to somehow take you away from the work of the movement, you know, that that would be too total, right? That they're not as drawn to that type of abstraction. I think my niece at midpoint also, and this is the part that pulls me in more, especially when I was many years ago during those interviews, you know, the sense of suspension, the sense that, um, and this is what I also feel in some of the stelves uh, created by Barbara Chase Rabu, that, uh, you know, that sense of what will blackness be? You know, what will black abstraction be? You know, the sense that at the midpoint of movements before, you know, we think of so many of these culture movements as being fully settled, right? But then we look at some of this art and we think about, well, what is that feeling? What is that aesthetic movement when things have not yet coalesced? And so I think uh, even appreciating the final destination of your question to move from a question of, of, about total abstraction to then black abstraction, I think black abstraction could also then not only be this sense uh, that you know, there's so many other you know interesting ways to fascinating ways to think of how artists have explained this. I'm thinking of a moment when um, Mel um, Melvin Edwards then is thinking about how there's a particular moment he realizes that abstract art could have a political dimension, and I think that. Uh, that's clearly, you know, that, that hovers around so many of our understandings of black abstraction. And I also think black abstraction, to go back to my obsession with what will blackness be, can also signal the not yet here. So it's not only necessarily the way of understanding the way that we are defining the binary uh, between what is abstract and what is political, but also, you know, this sense that black abstraction allows us to actually think about this unsettled blackness, blackness as a black aesthetic that is actually rooted in a mood, a feeling of what is not yet here. So I hope that begins to answer your question. Thank you very much for this brilliant talk. Uh, what is actually brilliant but political about the talk, opening with Steve Biko, closing with Haki Madibuti, <laughs> uh, it says something about the open-endedness of blackness. It, and, this open-endedness is also opposed, it, well, could, that one could call open totality, that one could oppose to close totality of whiteness. Mm -hmm. This is really what's interesting about blackness, where Haki Madibuti could come and get into this abstraction. Steve Biko, who was killed for his words, would come into this blackness mm -hmm. because the close totality of whiteness basically had fixed blackness. Mm -hmm. And you bring up that uh, subtlety. And in fact, it, it, you use that word. That's what's brilliant about it to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I really liked it. I mean, in the conference here, people refer to uh, UK where uh, lesbians, Chinese, uh, Afghanistan, before the Rushdie affair, mm -hmm. they were all called black in mm -hmm. order to have this abstraction. So thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for everything you said because I'm so glad to hear that the opening frame, right, the use of Vico and then that ending with Matabuti's, what I'm calling, it's, it's, a, it's a longer poem. Um, entitled Glendon Brooks, and that stanza is what I'm calling this performance, you know, this utter performance of strategic uh, abstraction, strategic black abstraction. And I'm so glad to hear that that resonated because I do think that uh, when we think about the global dimensions of black abstraction, uh, it might make us even more interested in terms of global black consciousness and breaking out of, you know, even this sense that, uh, uh, then sometimes even um, unconsciously, we're still lapsing into uh, 
one directional flows, this sense of, okay, well, this is how U.S. black power movement, uh, U.S. black arts movement, however we frame it, however we frame it, this is how it travels to other places like South Africa, other spaces. I think that more attention to this black abstraction actually makes it so that we actually will think about um, how these global black conscious flows work in a way that's uh, much less tidy, that can't be mapped in the same way, that actually allows us then, and throughout uh, these last days, you know, I've been, and, and I've been enchanted by some of these conversations I've had with people in terms of thinking about some of the artists in the black arts movement who, uh, artists like Kotsitsili, artists like Skunder, artists who, uh, so many artists who can't even be mapped or even named as being a part of, uh, uh, of a particular geographical understanding of the black arts movement. So I think black abstraction uh, allows us to feel that openness back to your work, so many layers of your work in terms of Glissant and that open boat, you know, to really understand how with Glissant's help, uh, Glissant's help, hopefully we're still clamoring for that opacity which remains yet another way of understanding the power of black abstraction. Hi. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was fantastic. Um, specifically, this idea of feeling or the description of feeling as a metaphysics or a form of abstraction. Thank you very much for that. I'm particularly, in the interest of quickness, here's a quick question. Um, in New York and Los Angeles, ideas of abstraction are key right now, and particularly uh, in relationship to surveillance, as a counter movement of surveillance in artists. I'm thinking people like American artists, Nikita Gale, Keon Gaskin, these sort of things. So I'm just curious, any thoughts around the sort of duality of abstraction, surveillance, and possibly inscription. Could you say a bit more? I'm not quite sure I understand the, the connection between surveillance and abstraction. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's more of a, <laughs> a longer conversation, I guess. Um, but there's a particular movement uh, in relationship to the uh, explosion of black portraiture in the United mm -hmm. States mm -hmm. as a form of co-option and a, a group of artists who have looked at that as a sort of different movement to move into abstraction as a way to sort of get around that issue, but also tying into the relationship of media representation of black death, for one example, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. another example, how forms of surveillance, not only police, but digital, are ways that pin down people. So mm -hmm. abstracting out the internet in a certain mm -hmm. sense too if that kind of makes sense. No, absolutely, it fully makes sense, and I love the question, and due to the fact that we don't have more time, I'm going to make my answer so short, but only because we're out of time, because there are layers, I think, that um, an answer you know, could have a full answer to that question, but uh, partially because last week I was teaching Claudia Rankin's white card, I think I wanna uh, actually um, use a text like that as a way to begin to address what you're getting at. To me, it's so striking. For those of you, I know we've all read Citizen. If you haven't read Rankin's white card, uh, it's fascinating to me how she's wrestling with these issues of surveillance in a play that also is pivoting on the art market and more specifically how a certain gaze, some parts of this play, it's surely uh, posited as a white gaze that's very tied to the surveillance, and then how more abstract um, um, art uh, created by um, uh, black people, how that art might be able to then uh, resist that surveillance. So, you know, since we're out of time, I guess I would say that I think absolutely both in the visual art and uh, in uh, 21st century uh, literature, uh, black diasporic literature, I do think there's great attention to this very question that, it, that I think that, you know, to me is fascinating to think about how we continue, I think for good reason, to uh, want to think about all of the nuances of black portraiture 
and back to everything that Barbara Chase Rabu in particular wants to defy in terms of those binaries, that portraiture and abstraction, those two things don't have to be set apart. So perhaps we need, in terms of resisting the surveillance, we need even more attention to abstract portraiture. Thank you.